5 a.m. in 1942. The day begins early when the world is at war. We're exactly 10 minutes. We dressed as I am, outside, ready to go for PT. These seven young men all descend from Second World War flight crews. In fact, three of their grandfathers flew together on a Lancaster. All right, here's where we separate the men from the boys. Let's get going. The longer we stand around, the longer we're going to freeze our asses out. The boys have almost no military experience, but they volunteer to live as wartime trainees, which was, of course, a mistake. Because as their granddad should have told them, the first rule of military life is never volunteer. and I'm thinking about her every other second. And I'm, I'm really ready to just get this done and get out of here. It's so hard yeah, just getting like three things. or four hours it's sleep really a night and then like waking up at like 5.30 and then just doing sort of physical training in the morning. It's just like, it's just the worst possible start to a day you can <sighs> possibly imagine. Just, yeah, the mornings are pretty long. They're just, uh, it's just so hard. You have about 10 minutes before you have, you have to be dressed, have everything organized so that you're ready for the inspection. Move. Between 1939 and 1944, almost 200,000 young men came to air crew camps like this. The days were long, the training tough and unforgiving. It had to be. The air war was cold, brutal, and merciless. Death by flak, death by fighter, death by collision. If these seven recruits really had gone to war, three would have died in combat, one would have been injured, one would have become a POW, and only two would have come home safely. Joe English was part of that fortunate few it's in the back of your mind all the time. Could, could we keep on being lucky, you know, because we would see different guys um, hit by f fighters or, or fl a flag. And gee, we, we lived a, a lucky life, you know, really. Joe and his crew flew on 625 Squadron, a battle-hardened Lancaster unit based in northern England. Their mission, to strike at the industrial heartland of Germany, again, and again, and again. The goal was to convince the Germans that we owned the skies and that we could more or less do damage to them at will, wherever we wanted. It was an exercise in, I don't know, applied psychology. We do enough of this and we'll shorten the war. We did a little of everything. We bombed oil refineries, we bombed um, uh, railway intersections, uh, that type of thing. Anything strategic, you know. Right, did you all have an opportunity to study your aircraft recognition last night? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What we're going to do this morning is we're going to conduct a very thorough review of aircraft recognition followed by your aircraft recognition test. The Harvard, you seem to be the most switched on here on aircraft recognition. Did you spend any time with your mates to teach them this stuff last night? Yes, sir, I did. Which aircraft is this, the bottom one? Measure Schmidt 110. Very good. Three out of every four aircrew recruits were destined for bomber command. Much of their fate would lie in the hands of one man, Arthur Harris, known to his crews as Butch short for butcher. History looks on Arthur Harris with two sets of glasses. There are those who still believe that he was a butcher, a butcher of the enemy. 
there are some who believe that he was a butcher of his own air crew. But when you read the files, the one thing that's quite clear is that although he sent his crews out night after night after night, he did everything possible to try to give them some greater chance of survivability. He should be as famous as Churchill in the fact that he knew what he was going to win the war. He really, you know, he, he was absolutely, had one tunnel vision about night, night RAF and RTF bombing. January 2nd, 1945. Harris issues orders for a massive attack on the birthplace of the Third Reich, Nuremberg. It will be the first operation for the Joe English crew. We had been on the squadron 10 days, two weeks, and we had done training exercises, but this is the first trip we were assigned to go on. We were nervous, naturally, everyone was. Even the guys that had done 20 trips were nervous. I was quite scared. As a matter of fact, we had a briefing uh, to uh, go on a trip, and it was canceled, and it was a good thing because uh, I sure didn't have my act together in the briefing room. Uh, so that when it came up next time uh, to go on this uh, trip to uh, Nuremberg, uh, uh, I was a little more settled, and I was able to jot down what I needed in, in the briefing and such. Adolf Hitler called Nuremberg the most German of all German cities. Just a few months earlier, it had been the site of Bomber Command's biggest disaster, when 96 aircraft were lost. More aircrew died in that one raid than were killed in the entire Battle of Britain. Nuremberg was one of the hearts of Nazism. It's where Lenny Riefenstahl did her films. That's where the annual rallies were. Uh, it was a symbol that wasn't going to remain unbombed. Joe's Lancaster was one of over a thousand bombers in the air that night. The pathfinders were going in first and they would lay down their flares and they would give us instructions, you know, the reds or the yellows or the blues. There was lots of flak. Lots of searchlights, weather was bad. It was just not a good trip. I was sure we were gonna go down, you know, because the flak was right even with us, perfectly even. And uh, the black spots, you could see it, boop, boop, boop. The raid was a success. Only six aircraft were lost. And the thousand-year-old city was left in flames. Joe and his crew returned safely, but their first taste of war had left its mark. Yeah, I thought of all those people down there, you know, whether, whether they're in uh, homes or uh, garages or underground or whatever, I just thought, those poor people, and here we are dropping these bombs on them. Yeah, yeah. The taking of lives did not come easily to the Joe English crew, who were little more than teenage boys when they were sent to kill. But the training they'd received in classrooms like this steeled them for the task at hand. Bomber Harris believed his crews could win the war, and he had an endless supply of young recruits eager to prove him right. done sharply, crisply, and with lots of energy. Right. Military instructors were either respected or feared by recruits. What? What? Oh, ten, what? Get it up there, get it up there. That was Warrant officer cool. Roger Noak falls in the very second good. category. As a serving member of a Canadian regiment, he's determined hand. to make sure Baker flight measures up. Like Until they prove their worth. As you were. They are semi-persons, they are not full persons until they prove that they are worthy to be amongst our ranks. Squad one! Squad one! Godfrey, wake up. Your hand is way too high, it's up here. 
Chris Gottfried has become Roger's whipping boy. One, two. He can march, he can salute, but Chris can't seem to do both at the same time. Gottfried, uh, <laughs> he's a funny guy. Gottfried is just, just a riot. He's got this funny spirit about him. I mean, you just look at him and you gotta smile and laugh, and I think that's just something amazing. Ah, uh, Gottfried's someone who I I just want to talk about a bit. Well, he's from Mississippi, so his accent definitely gets us. He looks like a bit of a goofball sometimes, but uh, underneath it, he's, he is sharp as a tack. Chris comes from a small town in Mississippi. His grandfather, Harvey, was the navigator on the Joe English crew. All right, now we're in uh, my hometown of Olive Branch, Mississippi, back here, and uh, we're gonna go downtown and uh, check out the sights. So, are you ready? Chris is only 19, but he's a young man of strong beliefs. Here now, I've developed some principles, and, and I think if I was gonna go off to war, and I might possibly die, I mean, every man has to die somehow, but maybe dying with honor isn't such a bad thing if you're just serving your country. Hey, Mr. Gottfried, can you stay there? Why? Chris and Roger Noak have only known each other a short time, but already there's tension. He always calls me a yank, and I've, I told him I'm not a damn yank. I'm down from the south, a rebel, not a damn yank, and he, he does it to me anyway. Squad one! One! one. Wake up! What is the difficulty over here, Mr. Gottfried? Getting confused, sir. He said I'm kind of the oddball, and I need to, um, I, I don't uh, think much of myself. He just doesn't know me, and he doesn't have any right to be uh, trying to act like he knows who I am, because he doesn't know Jack. Quick, march. Left, right, left. Right wheel means you turn right right away, you horrible little man. Payday for Yanks in the Royal Canadian Air Force. Early in the war, Canadian recruiting stations were flooded with young Americans like Chris. Some chafed under the British style of discipline. Others flourished. Britain's fight is theirs too, and how they can fly. Joe Hartshorn was one of those. Freshman year, 39-40, and my sophomore year, 40-41, I kept getting more and more irritated at the way uh, Roosevelt and the American people were sort of sticking their heads in the sand and not paying any attention to what was going on in uh, Europe. Joe was a 21-year-old Harvard student who came to Canada for one reason, to learn how to fight Hitler. I really wanted to, to fly and to get back at the, the Germans for what they were doing to what I sort of considered my second country, England. Following the attack on Pearl Harbor, Joe transferred to the U.S. Air Force. He'd heard a rumor that he would lose his citizenship if he didn't. Well, uh, it turns out later that was a bunch of hooey. But uh, the Americans made, I don't know, three or four times as much money as the Canadians made, who made three or four times as much money as the RAF made. And I looked at that and decided, well, I could afford to uh, join the Americans and make some more money. But Joe never flew a single mission for the Stars and Stripes. He was transferred again, this time to the lowest paying Air Force of all, the RAF. There I was in Northern England where there weren't very many Americans. This, this one lone brown uniform in a sea of blue uniforms up there, because the, the Royal Air Force was all around. They had airfields all over the place. And anything, anytime anything went wrong or something, they would say, <laughs> it was that American that American, which referred to me most of the time. Joe flew a courageous 34 operations and was personally awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross by the King. But his hero was Bomber Harris. It said that he stood uh, on the uh, buildings in London one night when the, London was terribly burning in 1940, uh, 41, and said uh, to somebody next to him, they have sown the wind and now they shall reap the whirlwind. And I thoroughly agreed with him, and I wanted to be part of the whirlwind. Right, in this period, we will be covering bombing. But before we can actually get into the whole situation, we must first be able to do basic mathematics. 
Come free. Get up here. Solve this problem for us. The rest of you, solve it on paper. The air war was a technical war, and math skills were highly regarded. Recruits who couldn't do high school math were out. Okay. Stand beside the equation there, Godfrey, so everybody can see what you've done. Okay, who else has the answer? Hellman, what's your answer? 1230.32, sir. Exactly what Godfrey has. Harper, what's your answer? I haven't got an answer, sir. Why not? I'm a little bit rusty on um, this format of maths, sir. How rusty? As rusty as rusty can be, sir. Godfrey and Hillman and Stevenson all have the same answer. They can do basic mathematics. The rest of you cannot do basic mathematics. If you cannot do basic mathematics in the Air Force, you will not be in the Air Force very long. You will be sent to the infantry, where you'll be used as cannon fodder. It would be nice to know how to do it, but it's just like, the thing is, like, when, when he just says, right, work out the equation, I'm just like, I'm sitting there just going, I have not got a clue what to do. Military training is all about the pecking order. Squad one! One! And Martin Harper is on the bottom rung. Don't move. Good. You okay there, Harper? Fine, sir. Why are your hands shaking again? Martin dropped out of school to become a musician. His rock and roll lifestyle has not impressed Roger Noak. Harper! Sit down. Remove your headdress. You can put your headdress on my desk. My assessment of you, you're a very smart young man. You can be anything you want to be in life. But we do have to work on making your body go right when it's supposed to go right and left when it's supposed to go left. Martin has been fighting his body since the moment he arrived. The physical demands have been relentless. And after a few days of training, Martin's body simply gave out. Well, for inspection today, it was really hot in the barracks, and plus we had to do uh, about 60 or 17 push-ups in there, and then I guess after that, the heat just got to him. I'm just overheating. I'm, I'm just feeling really faint. Uh, his, his bed just got thrown all over the floor, and uh, I think he took that pretty hard. It's just too much. I'm just losing all control. I think also possibly the amount of cigarettes he smokes doesn't help him either. I just lost every every bit of control. I, I, and I was, my head was wavering, and I started to see spots and, and start to black out. And... Now let's talk about your, your 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 civilian life before you came here. On the first day you were here, your hands were shaking so badly that we couldn't even light your cigarette. But then you since explained to me that it was your rather intense social life that caused you to have these sporadic bodily malfunctions. You're an incredibly keen mind. You can do anything you wish in life. But you have to develop some sense of self-discipline. And I can't let my buddies drag me down the spiral of misery with them. Right? He was telling the truth. My social life at home is, uh, you know, it's got its problems. You know, I've got my certain ways of life and, um, you know, I think this whole thing has really cleansed my soul and cleansed my mind as well. And, you know, I'm really looking forward to going back home with a different outlook on life, you know, rather than getting in the same old rut that I normally do back at home. For Chris Gottfried, it has been another bad day. And he faces one more humiliation. Godfrey, we have a problem with this morning. All right, there's four things you can do besides medication. Have a seat. The recruits have been fed an authentic Second World War diet, and the spam and beans has shut down his system. But in the military, there are no problems, only challenges, and every challenge has a solution, even constipation. For Chris, it's the good old-fashioned 1940s remedy, plums. I'll have your plumbing back to normal in no time. It's going to turn into a damn plum. All done. PT tomorrow, you will feel it. Some things in life are constant. Beans and bowels. Always have, and probably always will be, an endless source of humor for men. 
Run the whole way. <laughs> you just better hope your deer don't go. Because if you are, it's a relic. Oh, oh, oh. I say if we see him running, we all run to the water and get him before him. I just did not like the food. The uh, cabbage, they had, uh, well, like it had been boiled for three days. <laughs> and I sure didn't think much of that. Prune juice. Which I'm going to chug, I'm sorry. <laughs> Markins. How many times did you sh today? Today, uh, I sh 15 times. <laughs> 15 times? Tomorrow, I'm gonna try to break the record. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike their grandfathers, few of the recruits have ever handled a gun. Today, this will change. The weapon of choice, an original Second World War, Lee Enfield, 303. Ten pounds of wood and steel, accurate within a mile. Sid Stevenson can shoot. He's a 17-year-old Manitoba farm boy with an openness that belies the cynicism of his generation. Like, they were giving up their, their lives for us and what they believed in. Like, that's pretty amazing, too. Like, it's actually your life. You're giving up your life for something you believe in. Like, that's pretty big. Every morning, I have to go out and feed my horses because uh, around this time of year, it gets pretty cold. My cousin, my sister, and myself come down to Sirs for voice lessons. <laughs> Sydney grew up on the Canadian prairies, a place where opportunity comes dressed in coveralls. I live on a farm in the middle of nowhere. I love it, yeah, it's the life. I, I don't think I could stand living in, a, uh, in the city because it's just so loud. Boys like Sydney have never hesitated to fight for what they believe in. 60 years ago, his grandfather, Clint Wetter, was a young farmer who went to war. My decision was that, that I had to become involved and um, do whatever they wanted me to do. So it was at the end of the Depression, and, and there were a lot of farm boys, country boys, had no future and um, no money, and so this was an opportunity for them to get a paycheck. Most aircrew flew only one tour of 30 operations and then were released to other duties. Clint flew two. Among those, the Nuremberg operation, which began Joe English's war. But it's another sortie that has stayed with him across the decades. The night Clint bombed Dresden. On his second tour, Clint was a pathfinder marking targets for the bomber stream above him. At the time, we thought, great, we, we had a successful raid. And I think about that and I said, gee, I was a major part of that. Now, am I going to be held accountable <laughs> for killing those 60 or 50,000 people? Because obviously I had a big hand in it. The raid on Dresden created a firestorm, and the entire city was consumed in an inferno. Clint chose the spot for the firebombs to fall. I have questioned myself, and I, and I have spoken to other people and say, well, what do you think? Should I feel guilty or should I not? I guess the only solace we can think of is that it was a job that had to be done. The bombing of Dresden had limited strategic value, and an estimated 50,000 people died that night. But like Nuremberg, it was a target bomber command was determined to destroy. Sixty years later, historians still debate whether the raid was necessary. The idea was that, that bombing could somehow produce a cataclysmic blow that would cause an enemy 
to give up. The Germans were frightened to heck that if Bomber Command could do this two or three more times in quick succession, maybe something might crack. The little boxes are up there on the shelf, yeah, yeah. yeah with the names on them. Clint Wetter finished his war after flying 55 operations and was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. Older and perhaps wiser, the idea of his grandson Sidney going to war is unthinkable. I guess I would tell him to avoid it, if possible. Even though we, we've got to realize that uh, throughout it all, there was a, a certain amount of glory to it until the time came when you got badly shot up and your chum beside you got blown to bits. And there was no glory there then. Okay, guys, what we're gonna practice this afternoon in the hangar is we're gonna practice our bomb aiming. So we'll have a bombardier, we'll have a navigator, and we'll have a pilot. The navigator will Bomber Command jobs. thought attacks on German First cities would end the war. Recruits were taught the principles of aerial bombing, bombing trainer, early in right their training. Here. So he'll say, right 10 degrees, left 20 degrees, okay, straighten it up now, hold the heading. Right in the middle of Peterborough here is a great big square building. It's the most The instructors have created a basic bombing drill for Baker flight we'll to practice, to the sort of thing wartime recruits often did. The time of the fall at 10,000 okay. is 24.92. 24 24.2? 24 92. The speed is 40. It will be 27.3 seconds. 27.3 seconds. Fuck. Is it Petersburg? That little town? Peterborough. Peterborough. Oh. Goddamn oh. Westerners. Peterborough. In the exercise, John, Sidney, and Chris are trying a bombing run. 30 degrees left. Here's the point right there on the map. The orphanage. <laughs> We're only... We blew up the community center. It's just in the dead. cemetery. The drill has been fun, but it's also taught the boys an important lesson. Even without the threat of flak or fighters, hitting a target was a combination of geometry, courage, and most of all, luck. Well, it's a lot harder than you think. Like, by the time you say bombs away, the, the X mark where you're supposed to let it go is gone and uh, you've overshot the target by, you know, a mile. On the... It's actually really difficult. Sydney's complaint is an echo from his granddad's time, as Bomber Command was plagued by missed targets. In 1941, a secret report was commissioned, which asked a simple question. Do bombs hit their targets? The conclusion shocked the high command. The study showed that only a fraction of bombs landed within five miles of their aiming point. For John Lowe, Daniel Crow, and Matthew English, it has been a bad day, which is about to get worse. Right, left, right, left. Right, left, right, left, right, left. They've been put on what's known as defaulters parade. Halt! One, one, two! Defaulters parade, present! And! One, two, three, one, two, three, one! What in the world are you doing? <coughs> Their troubles began early. Morning inspection and warrant officer Noak is in a foul mood. 
Sergeant Williams and Flight Sergeant Finley have informed me that you should be ready for my inspection and you should be able to meet my standard. If you do not meet my expectations, you will be handed out remedial training in the form of guard duty at the gate. So I hope you're up to snuff. Why does it look like somebody slit your throat? What's this crap on your collar? This white stuff on your collar? Shaving foam, sir. Why is that there? Is that part of your uniform? No, sir. The king does not issue uniforms with dried shaving cream on them. The other two, uh, during our inspection this morning, um, the warrant officer wasn't too impressed with them. <clears throat> Mr. Lowe, how are you doing this morning? Fine, sir. Lowe got in trouble for um, not having a clean enough shave. Did you shave this morning, Mr. Lowe? Yes, sir, just now, sir. Well, tomorrow morning you'll step closer to the razor when you shave. Yes, sir. Crow's bed, he got in trouble actually for his, his sheets. You could, you could sort of see it through it and I, I think it was a pretty ridiculous reason for getting uh, his bed thrown apart all over the room. Good Lord. Turn around look at your bed. Big dents, big rolls, big creases everywhere. What the hell were you doing with this thing? What's on there, sir? Very good. You'll do better tomorrow. Mr. English. I actually got in trouble in class in class today. I got in trouble for writing my girlfriend, for Julia, a note. You are on guard duty one hour tonight at the gate for having a very, very poor bed layout. You're on guard duty for not shaving properly. One hour. You have 10 minutes to clean up this bloody mess, and I want to see you out on the road in front of our classroom in 10 minutes. Move! On the ground, BCATP discipline was tough. In the air, it saved lives. Joe English was known as a disciplined pilot. If somebody told him to move left, left, he didn't ask why, he moved. And I know that some guys uh, would complain that, that they would tell the pilot something and the pilot would say, what's wrong? You know, or why, why do we do that? That's no good. New crews like Joe's were called sprogs and their death rate was especially high. Almost half of all sprog crews were lost before their 10th operation. Joe almost died on his eighth. We thought we were in the middle of the bomber stream as usual and out right on track and at the right height. <clears throat> and, and this aircraft came from nowhere, it went right in front of us. Now, mind you, we was loaded with 2,000 gallons of gas and six and a half tons of bombs. And Joe pulled it up and then he saw us and he went to pull up. I had to. Uh, sort of stall the aircraft to get over the top of this one. And I swear to this day I could read the call signs of that. And then it stalls, you see, it starts to slide backwards. Yeah. And then, of course, he pushed it ahead to right it, and it stalls again because it, it can't take the load. Joe had lots of nerve. And he was, uh, wasn't tall, but he was husky, <laughs> you know. Advance left, turn. Defaulters' parades were common sights at training camps, as recruits were taught to expect the unexpected and prepare for the worst. One, three, three. About turn. One, two, three, one. About turn. One, two, three, one. Slow arms. One, two, three, one, two, three, one. Don't move your head around the rifle. Move the rifle around your head. Present. Arms! One, two, three, one, two, three, one! Extend your arms. All the way out. Keep it steady. Stone face. I had a pinched nerve in my hand at one point. So, uh, yeah, that hurt a lot. But, uh, hey, lads. I know why I had it coming, so... Make sure I don't write letters in class.
it helped me just to work on the rifle drill and I got it pretty much spot on. So I'm happy, I'm, I'm tired, but I'm happy. Two, four, five. Four, five. English style. Six, five, five, seven, six, seven, eight, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, 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 Again, I'm late, like always. Um, we're just gonna, you know, I'm just gonna show you my church and some of my friends that I hang out with and stuff. And well, it's Sunday, so it's a beautiful day. And uh, yeah, I'll see you later. Like many teenagers, John dreams of being in a band with his buddies. <laughs> When his grandfather, John Fraser, was about the same age, he took part in the famous Dam Busters raid and watched as his friends died. Well, he was originally an observer, but they made him a bomb aimer. Actually, I think it was maybe about a month or um, even shorter than that before he, he went on this, this raid that, you know, completely changed his life. John Fraser flew on the elite 617 squadron, which attacked German hydroelectric dams with experimental bouncing bombs. Fraser's Lancaster was shot down, and he was sent to Germany's notorious Stalag Luft III, where he helped plan the great escape. John Fraser survived the war, only to die in a float plane accident. His grandson, John Lowe, is not sure if he'll go to war, but he's proud his granddad did. We've become almost kind of cynical of war, um, especially with Vietnam and the Gulf War. I mean, they were very, uh, very political wars and the, the thing about World War II was it, it was very black and white it was us against them the good versus evil oh 700 hours an early morning Baker flight has actually been looking forward to the recruits have marched to a local gun range where they'll get a chance to shoot their weapons. Each member of the flight has been given a Second World War Lee Enfield 303, famous for its kick. Most of these boys have never fired a rifle before. The Lee Enfield will be the first time they've heard the sounds of war. Grouping on the left target, five rounds only, on your own time. Fire! Look at your target. The coaches will come around and tell you what you're doing wrong or doing well. We got a sniper over here. Well, if you don't make it in the Air Force, we sure have room for you in the infantry, that's for sure. Nice shooting, Helen. Good job. I thought I did pretty bad, actually, but it turned out really good for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why. What do you think's wrong here? Why is it left to right? Um, trigger control. Trigger control. You want to take up the slack, right? And then you just keep putting pressure on it until it goes off on its own. I was just su really surprised by the recoil of it. The recoil is amazing. It really kicks you back. I was told that it was going to hurt, but I mean, it doesn't really hurt. It's quite a good sort of scar from, from shooting a gun, really. But that was really good fun, really good fun. Right here, I've got a huge lump, and there looks like some, uh, some redness there. I was a little bit uh, put off by the sounds of it first. I didn't realise they'd be so loud. You 
You are a feather plucked from the wings of the angel of death, Godfrey. Look at that target. Outstanding. <laughs> Uh, here's here's one of our better shooters, Stevenson. Obviously, he's a farmer, so uh, he's been out firing rifles probably since he was how old? Five, six? About seven or eight, actually. There you go. Yeah, you got you definitely got to find that right spot in the shoulder. Um, I had a hard time finding the spot right away, and I was getting it right up on my collarbone. Don't have as much meat as the rest of the boys, so uh, it's gonna leave a fair bruise for sure. I think you guys will enjoy this a little bit. Hopefully you can get that in the light there. Yeah, it's a nice big bruise. You can see that. Wartime recruits were streamed into combat roles as the fortunes of war required. But no matter what rank or responsibility, everyone was taught how to shoot and all crew carried sidearms. The Joe English crew faced death many times, but never fired their guns in anger. Not so Reg Patterson's crew. We got hit one night over Ocker, short of Cologne, we're heading for Cologne, and we were about 15 minutes back. When up came a buddy, burst the plaque, and they all hit us. Reg was a Lancaster pilot on 612 Squadron who fought his way through many a battle until one night he lost the fight. It was very heavy flak that day. You saw it, but you didn't really see it sort of ahead of you or any particular place, it was just all over the place. You, see. you just sort of. Crunched in and hoped that you're going to go through it. And it blew the wing right off. So, of course, we were no longer an airplane. They'll fly on one engine very well, but not on one wing. Reg was at 20,000 feet when his aircraft was hit. He kicked his way out of his shattered cockpit and tumbled into space. And I'll buy that tail just by inches. And that's the last I saw of the airplane, of course, because suddenly it was quiet as the most. Reg and two other members of his crew survived. The rest fell to earth in their flaming, spinning Lancaster. I never think of these fellows as being old, dead guys. I, they're just, to me, in my mind, just exactly they were the day we left, you know. Young and full of fun, great guys. These seven young recruits will never face the shooting war their grandfathers did. But the men who flew with Joe English to Nuremberg or died in the skies with Reg Patterson's crew were once, like the bomber boys, a Baker flight. Young and brave, dreaming of a future where anything was possible. Next time on Bomber Boys, Baker flight takes to the skies. Warrant Officer Roger Noak is not happy with the attitude of his rebel recruits and lays down the law. Everything was going exceedingly well up until now. You've kind of let the flight down a bit. And a surprise inspection brings laughter and tears. <laughs> That's next time on Bomber Boys. What a hell of a